morning to all of you, to our online viewers, good morning. I welcome all of you to our worship service. We are gathered here to celebrate the goodness of our God. Please recite with me our memory verse found in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Let's read it all together. Ready, go. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. This is a rhetorical question that reminds us how gracious and how loving our God is. Please do memorize this in your heart. So let's, re let's recite it once again. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all? all things. Today we will have communion. Let us prepare our hearts and for those who worship with us through Zoom, please prepare your own communion elements. For the kids church, we encourage that you bring your kids to join the kids church every Sunday 9.45 to 10.45 at the lower ground floor. Wonderful and fun activities awaits them. For this Saturday, we invite all the youth to sit and relax while watching a movie together. We will be using the big screen here, so be here before 3 p.m. this Saturday so that you will not miss anything. A special announcement for all teenagers, CTF Room is now ready for you. It's a place where you can hang out before and after the worship service. CTF Room is located beside the cross point downstairs. So see you guys there after the service. For the young adult and adults, there's a webinar for you this Saturday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. via Zoom. The title is Broken Faith, answering the question, how do we trust God when our circumstances make us doubt Him more? So the speaker is a best-selling author, Nelson D. For more details, please look for Pastor Grace Velasco. The month of October is our mission, Missions Month. Here are the following activities. October 7, this Friday, will be combined fellowship with the young adult, with the adults, and the seniors. And on October 23 is our Missions Festival. This is a special Sunday service. So in preparation for this big event, Two weeks will be allotted starting October 14 for preparations for this event. So October 28 is family day. All families are welcome. For the baptismal classes, it's now open for signing up. For those interested, please approach our church secretary, Sister Melchi, or just approach one of our pastors to register or to uh, show your interest for it. So please check the poster for more details. Every Wednesday and Thursday, we have our prayer meeting. Let us continue building the habit of praying together and praying for one another. For our tithes and offering, if God calls you to give in partnering with the ministry, you may drop your free, free will offering at the back or deposit it at the details found on the screen. Let us all stand as we read our call to worship. Our call to worship is found in Psalm 56, 12 to 13. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, indeed you are worthy of praise. No amount of words can really describe you. And that's how wonderful, how glorious you are. Lord, may your name be glorified, Lord God, in the people today. As we worship you with one heart, may you guide us as we focus our hearts to you. Heavenly Father, may you bless also, Lord God, all the people will worship you today that they will be encouraged and be strengthened 
by your word, by the preaching of your word. May you bless our speaker, Lord God, Pastor Paul, as, we, as he delivers your word powerfully to the hearts of the people. May the praise and worship team also lead us to worshiping you. And Heavenly Father, may you be with us. Your presence be with us, Lord God. Help us to feel you and to know you more. May your name be glorified. In Jesus Christ, let me pray. Amen. In running this Christian walk of ours, we may feel like we've grown weaker. God is about to tell us this morning that His grace is sufficient. Amen? And His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. Just like how Apostle Paul responded to the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Let us respond this morning by lifting our voices and shouting out, your grace is enough. Let's shout out. One, two, three. Your grace is enough. Again, one more time. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Sing our first song, Your Grace is Enough. It is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. your love and justice God you use the weak to lead the strong yes Lord you lead us you lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember
to our God indeed. Thank you for your love, Lord. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace, for your overflowing love. We, be, we come before you this morning, O oh Lord, broken, full of joy. Lord, but you deserve all the glory. That's why we offer up our worship this morning. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your Thank you, Brother Tim and uh, the rest of the worship team. We praise the Lord. Our band was able to lead us in worship this morning. Um, let's give God a round of applause once again to worship Him. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is a joyful privilege to worship God with you today, to celebrate Sabbath, to find rest in God's presence through songs, prayer, and His Word. If it is your first time to be here with us today or in Zoom, Allow me to personally welcome you to our CGC community where you find yourself in a sanctuary of sinners. We are here not because we are perfect and sinless, but rather we are here because we are individuals who are sinners in need of God's grace and His daily compassion. I'd like to ask you first with this one, what do you feel when you hear the words, it is paid, bayad na? Bye bye, impas na bye. How do you feel? You feel good? Feel relieved? No? In, pag five years na insurance, 20 years na, impas na good. Ang balay, impas na good. 20 years, 30 years after. No? 
whether you're the one paying or you're the one being paid both, no? As a sigh of relief. Who among you here loves to hear these words? When you call the waiter for, sir, uh, can I get my bill? And then the waiter comes to you and says, sir, it's already paid. You realized when you entered the restaurant, you saw Pastor Paul the eye. Then you remember, basi gilibri ko ni Pastor Paul niya. Pag ni mo sa corner, nagkaway si Pastor Paul. Uh, di ba? It's a nice feeling. No, you have your friends, your friends in high school, someone paid for your meal in a restaurant. How does it feel when you have enough rebates already, re- enough points, na makalibri na ka worth isa ka grocery, or worth isa ka one-way trip sa imuang mabuhay miles, or you have enough cash back that you can pay for your credit card bill for that month. Diba? It feels good. Isn't it nice to hear those things? For those of you in the 80s, 90s, in high school, you remember those times when you're lining up in the canteen, then suddenly your friend receives two shopao or two banana queue and hands one to you? Diba, lamig yung feeling? <laughs> no? You remember, those who are taking motorella, you have someone with you, and then suddenly your friend tells you, Ibay, ako na bayad si mong plate, Ibay, ako na bahalaan ni. Eh. Okay, what is in silly? No? It's a nice feeling when you hear someone tells you that it is paid. On my first uh, international disciple making conference in Singapore in 2009, I was told that someone would be willing to pay or someone would pay for my plane fare and my stay in Singapore for, for that conference. I was just five months in Davao serving there, and someone was already willing to pay for my, for my stay. And uh, my plane fare. Ang akong problem nilang is my bayad sa noodles, no? Sa uh, ka- kanang uh, coconut milk na noodles. I forgot, forgot the name, no? The spicy noodles uh, f- famous in Singapore. That was a wonderful news for me. Uh, would you agree with me? Can you raise your hands? You agree with me, right? Come on, come on, come on. Raise your hands. So, katong dili gani mag raise your hands. Na mong problema pa mo. Pila pa ka years yung ano. <laughs> It's a wonderful news you know, to hear that it is paid already. Our passage, this, our passage this morning is found in 2 Samuel 24, which also talks about something being paid. And so, I titled our sermon this morning, It's Paid, the Price of Pride. Let us read a portion of that chapter. And so, please uh, turn with me to 2 Samuel 24, if you have your Bibles with you. Let's go to 2 Samuel 24, and we'll just read verses 21 to 25. But we'll cover other passages, other portions in the chapter as we go along with the sermon. Okay? 2 Samuel 24, verses 21. And Arauna said, Why has my Lord King come to his servant, David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people? Then Arauna said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arauna gives to the king. And Arauna said to the king, May the Lord God, may the Lord your God accept you. Now here's David's answer, verse 24. But the king said to Arauna, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver, and David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from the land. And God bless us as we read his word. Before the good news that the payment was made, there was this problem. In chapter 24, verses 1 and the following tells us that there's this segment of David's life wherein he made not so good decisions. No? Remember David and Bathsheba as well? Here's another segment in his life where uh, he did not make a very good decision. And this is our first subject. David's census, which is a result of his pride and false trust. In 2 Samuel 24, 1 and following, we could see there that David asked his commander to number Israel and Judah to count his military men. 
in another kind of very similar story, 1 Chronicles 21.1. Now, let me explain a little bit. 2 Samuel is written by Samuel. Samuel, 1st and 2nd, written by Samuel. The 1st and 2nd Chronicles is written by the chroniclers or the writers, official writers, when the temple was built, when there was this uh, great empire already in Israel. And so, major official, this one written by Samuel, still official, but this one kind of organized already. And so, they kind of writing the same thing, and, but there are little differences, right? So, you could see this 2 Samuel 24, very similar to 1 Chronicles 21 as well. In 2 Samuel 24, we get to see there that God incited David to count the men. In 1 Chronicles, there's, there's, uh, the verse there tells us that it was Satan who incited David. Now, God does not do evil himself, but he can use evil agent to allow things to happen. And sometimes he uses these things to accomplish his purposes. And in David's pride, Imagine David standing in the balcony of his palace, seeing the campgrounds, seeing his military men, the number of tents. Slowly, I think, I believe, pride is rising up in his heart. Mm, I want to count my men. I want to see if my men is enough to capture another nation, to capture another land. Or if they attack us, will we be strong enough to defend? Will we, will we be powerful enough? And so that's how it triggered the pride of David and so instructed his commander to count his military man. But when you read further, when you have your Bible still open, verse 3, someone actually tried to stop him from committing this mistake. His commander, Joab, said, David, are you sure, king? Now, do we need to do this? No, it's okay. I, I like our armies to increase. We have more military power, but are we sure we're going to do this? Without a respond, David asserted himself and instructed, you go and count. And so Joab and his team went around the place, went around the region, counted, and it totaled to about a more than a million. 800 in Israel, 500,000 in Judah, about a million plus of people. And so the result of the census was there. Now, right now we might find this harmless. Those who, are, those who have companies, those who have businesses, we count our sales. We have yearly reports. Even in church, we count our attendance so we know who we need to follow up or we know what wrong, what wrong things are we doing, what are the things that we need to improve so we could invite more people to church. In school, we count the number of enrollees to see um, if we need to improve in our teaching. We, we do certain countings for evaluation purposes, for, strategi for, for strategizing our, our plans and these things, right? We, f we may find the census harmless. But if you're familiar with Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, if you're familiar with the Old Testament laws, it says here, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord. When you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. Unfortunately, David did not listen to Joab and failed to obey God's command. So here we get to see that David doing this military census resulting to his pride and false trust in himself and losing faith in God. He now has this uh, pride, his trust in the empire that he had built. It is a false pride and trust in the military that arose in his heart. If only, I think, if only David still followed Exodus 30.12, as they counted, after they counted, okay, guys, here are the animals, let's do the offerings, let's do sacrifices. He may have been reminded that this number of people, these successes, these victories that he has is because of the God they are offering to. But without this offering, without these sacrifices, it led all the glory, all the accolades to himself, thinking that it was all because of his wisdom, all of his courage, and these things. Brothers and sisters, a spirit of pride, conceit, and haughtiness is a terrible evil. Because when we exalt ourselves, we become self-centered, which means that we tend to ignore others. We become self-centered, we degrade others. It means that we see ourselves as above those others. No, in ranking nga, above, above nga tayo. We are the employers, they are the employees, we are the parents, they are the kids. We are the adults, they are the children. And all the more, 
when we take pride in our ambitions, in our achievements, we would look down on others. We walk around acting as though we are better looking, more capable, more deserving, more moral, more virtuous, more righteous, and more religious. And because we think we are better than others, we sometimes think that we deserve more attention, we deserve more recognition, we deserve more praise and honor. We sometimes end up to be like Karen. Where's your manager? No. Business class. I paid much for this. I'm first in line. We tend to be arrogant. We tend to be haughty. Look around and notice the people who are proud. They walk in a spirit of conceit. They walk in a spirit of pride. And note the counterfe counterfeit personality that they have their wrong sense of self, their, their puffed-up personality. Listen to what the Word of God says about pride. The Word of God says in 1 Timothy 3.6, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fell into the condemnation of the devil. Very interesting, this Greek word here in 1 Timothy 3.6. It's called, in Greek, it's tufu. And you know what it means in Greek? It means to raise a smoke to wrap a mist, puff up with pride. So, di ba sa Bisaya, ang pride or kanang hambugero, it's called kanang ano, dakog ulo. <laughs> so, imagine, there's, it's like there, there's a smoke, there's a mist being wrapped in that person's head. No, he cannot see himself clearly in front of a mirror. He's trying to use that smoke to cover his real self and so people would see just that smoke because he's feeling arrogant. No. Oh, there's a good sense of pride, right? When we talk about a uh, sense of dignity, you, you have a healthy self of a healthy self-esteem, there's a good sense of pride. You, 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 you take pride in the good things that you have done. There's also a positive side of pride because we don't want to fall into self-pity as well. But we need to avoid the wrong kind of pride. Being proud of a particular characteristic, a particular, particular skill, a particular possession, being arrogant. That's the kind of pride that the Bible doesn't want us to get into. Focusing on ourselves, trusting on ourselves and not on God. Recently, we had our foundation celebration here in school, or Christian, for 37 years. God has been with us. And we thank the Lord, we worship the Lord for that. And in that celebration, there are many opportunities actually, not opportunities, there are many, uh, if you're not careful, many factors that we can wrongly take pride in. For the students, if you want the cheer dance, that pride on self might creep in there if you are not careful. For the invitational games who did not have any lost, there's that certain pride. We also had our alumni association basketball league as well. We have two teams who got their first win. Pride can come in their teachers. When we receive all the attentions, we receive all the accolades, all the flowers and the gifts, there might be some certain pride, ah, it's because of me. It can also even result to a, a discouragement for others. You know, why, why, don't, why, why I have only a few, few flowers, few attention from my students, and this teacher has these things. Those, those who have a lot, pride will be a challenge for them. Other teachers would feel a little bit discouraged. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful how we take on pride. Pride is very dangerous. Another challenging, challenging thing about pride is that it happens internally. Most people who are struggling with pride, it only happens within themselves. Because the very clear pride, the arrogant one, the one walking in, like, like uh, grandizing themselves, parading themselves, that's very clear. But there's a certain pride that you battle within yourself. Someday, you will show them. But no one seems to know that you're struggling within yourself, and that's kind of dangerous. If that is left unchecked, eventually it will result to a show-off. It can result to uh, conflicts in relationships. Did you hear the clever salesman uh, pitch that goes something like this? This resulted to many hundreds of sales. Ganitong line ng isang salesman. Let me show you something several of your neighbors said that you cannot afford. Dang. Balikan ni kag electric fan. <laughs> no? 
And siyempre, ang customer, my neighbor said that. How much is that? Palit da yun. Did you know what the other department said? They said, they, you cannot afford though this TV. Huh? Palit da yun. Because of pride. Because of pride, we make wrong decisions in life. The Apostle Paul gave us these four things how we ought to deal with pride. He said, do not overvalue yourself. Second, rely on the Holy Spirit. Do not just rely on yourself, rely on the Holy Spirit. Number three, value your calling or value your ministry, no, not just yourself. And fourthly, serve the Lord with joy and gladness. Whatever calling, whatever task the Lord has given you, serve it with joy. And these four things... Seeing yourself as who you are by the grace of God, not overvaluing yourself, relying on the Holy Spirit, valuing ministry, serving with joy will help you deal with pride. Now, as we talk about pride, let us also not forget that there are many other sins. No, pride is just one of them. There are sins of immorality, sins of dishonesty, and these other sins can also result to consequences it also involves payment that needs to be paid. But before we go to the payment, let's look at subject number two. David committed census. He did a census. In subject number two, David made a confession before the Lord because he knew that he made a mistake. And with that came the result of judgment and the consequence of his sin. Let us go to verse 10. Verse 10 reads, But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Census, confession. But brothers and sisters, we must not forget, though in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Yes, correct? If many of us immediately confess with our sins, that's wonderful. I hope we do practice that. Let us not delay our confession. Because every time we delay our confession, that means it is delayed reconciliation with God and the people that we uh, offended. And delayed reconciliation means delayed healing as well. We need to remember this part, especially young people. When I was uh, a teenager, when I was in my ye high school years, I seem to have this thinking, that as long as I ask for forgiveness, as long as I confess my sins to God, I'm good. I can sin again. I'm okay to sin again. And everything is okay. And I had to struggle with that. I had to talk to um, some pastors, some friends. So we have to take note of this misconception that you may have when we confess our sins to the Lord it doesn't mean yes we are forgiven yes our relationship with the Lord is restored but it doesn't mean the consequence of sin also vanishes the consequence the fruit of sin is still there we reap what we sow if we sow sin and evil we reap the consequences of sin and evil this is a natural law that is set up throughout the universe. If a person becomes intoxicated with alcohol and he becomes part of a driving accident, vehicular accident, and then later on he asks God for forgiveness, he confesses that he was drinking, yes, he's forgiven, his wife may forgive him, but it doesn't mean that his injuries will just suddenly go away. It doesn't mean that he could just overnight drive again after his confession. No, The steel metals would be inserted there. It will be there to help him walk, to help him move. A man who commits adultery, he will reap broken trust between him and his wife, as well as, as, well as all other consequences of an adultery. The relationship may start heal after the confession, the repentance, but the hurt, the pain, it will still be there. The loss of trust... The, the loss of trust, you know, the wife will always be suspicious na, it won't, it won't easily go away. So it is with any act of wickedness. There's always that consequence. Young people remember this. When we cheat in class, I know, online, you can, you have, you can have many screens, 
You can have multiple applications. Some even have three screens, five screens at home. It does not take away the consequence of being sent to the disciplinarian's office when we sin, when we cheat. There may be consequences. There are consequences if you are caught. If you are so good you are not caught, you think that there are no consequences, well, think again. Because it will change your heart. It will change your perspective in life. That if there are things that you can go away with, as long as you are good in hiding it, <laughs> you can do it again. And eventually, it will change who you are. It will affect your decision-making later on as you become an adult. Very similar. I know you, we are familiar with the, with the movie Lord of the Rings. There's a new series now, right now, right? When, when the, the ring of power was given to Frodo Baggins, to Bilbo Baggins, it's a, it's a symbol of sin. It's a symbol of temptation and sin. And so it was uh, putting a heavy weight on them. It was changing them. It was making them self-centered. It was making them very secretive. It was kind of really affecting their relationship with other uh, characters in the movie and in the book. There are consequences if we commit sin. If we, commit, if we do sin, there are consequences. And sometimes even if, if we just put our foot in temptations, no, we allow temptations to, okay lang, I know I can handle myself. Little do we know there's actually consequences already. It's online shopping, add to cart, add to cart. Add to cart lang, add to cart. You have hundreds add to cart already there. It's not sin yet. <laughs> But little do you, I think you know algorithm. <laughs> Later on, all your notifications will be about that item that is in your cart, or it will always remind you. Remind <laughs> you have this item in your and then eventually, when you put down your guard, there's already that surplus spending. No, there's already that consequence of that. Di pa yun sin ha? Temptation pa lang yun. All right. So let us not be overly confident. Confession brings about forgiveness, yes, but don't be overconfident. Every time we commit sin, every time we expose ourselves to strong temptations, to temptations, there are consequences that we cannot escape. There are consequences of sin. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7 to 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In David's case, the consequences was tough, but good for him. In a way, because he was given a choice. For us right now, God does not speak to us through a prophet and gave us a choice. We get the consequences, what we deserve. In the story of David in 2 Samuel, he was given three options. What kind of consequence would he want to take? The first one, three years of famine. The second one, three years of three months of fleeing from his enemies while they chased him. The third one, three days of plague throughout the land of Israel. And so hearing these dreadful options, David became so troubled, he, he had difficulty deciding what to do. He felt so incapable of choosing. And so his response is kind of beautiful. He ended up surrendering himself to God's mercy. Verse 14 says, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into human hands. So, Lord, you decide for me. And at the end of the discussion and the, and the end of the narrative, the Lord, the Lord chose the third one. Three days of plague. Striking the entire nation, the plague took the lives of over 70,000 people. But God is gracious. The Lord showed mercy. And this is where we go to our third subject. David's prayer in the altar of sacrifice this is God's deliverance. Verse 17 reads, Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, the people of Israel, what have they done? Please, Lord, let your hand be against me and against my father's house. David uttered this prayer 
Then he built an altar of sacrifice, seeking the Lord to stop the judgment that is happening in his land and his people. These events took place on the climactic third day of the plague that was sweeping the nation. And the first thing that we can notice here is that David did not practice what is common today, the blame game. Because of you, it's not my fault. It's because of my parents, it's because of my classmates, it's because of my subordinates. Here, David took responsibility. He does not want his people to suffer. He wants God to focus on him. So hearing that many people were now suffering, David went to the Lord and prayed and asked God what he can do. And God gave him this instruction to build this altar of sacrifice in this threshing floor of Arauna. Through the prophet God, the Lord commanded him to go to Arauna and to build an altar of sacrifice there. And here's the beautiful portion in this passage. David personally went up to purchase that land. But when he approached Arauna, when he approached that place, the threshing floor, Arauna, who was also seeing the people suffering the plague, immediately offered. They had this conversation, King, my king, what are you doing here? And the king said, I want to purchase this land. And Arauna immediately offered, King, I can give you the land. Here are also the animals and the sacrifice, the animals that you need for the sacrifices. This is yours. You can use this place for the sacrifice, for the offering, so that the plague will stop. But David insisted on the basic principle for all worship and service. True sacrifice demands payment. True sacrifice demands payment. David was unwilling to offer the Lord anything that cost him nothing. For David, in other words, he's saying, if there is no cost, there is no real sacrifice. And so, David insisted on paying for the property and the animals to be used in the sacrifice. In the same way with our service to the Lord, it requires sacrifice. In the same manner in our obedience to God, it is not going to be a bed of roses. It is not going to be a walk in the park. It's not going to be about convenience and comfort. As followers of Jesus Christ, He desires that we become contributors instead of just spectators. God wants us to be participants, not just attendants. God desires, God calls His people to roll up our sleeves, bring out our aprons, and get our hands dirty instead of just serving Him by mouth. We are not God. God created the heaven and the earth by the power of His mouth. And many of us just want to serve Him with our mouth. Mandar. We are His creatures. We are called to be stewards. And God has given us the instructions to take part in what He is doing in this world. We are His hands and His feet. And as, and his, as his children, we need to do our part. This chapter, this story in the life of David is a good time where we can assess our ministry, where we can assess our motives, where we can assess our service and our giving to God. Are we only giving out of our convenience? Are we only serving God within our comfort zone? Are we only reaching out to people uh, we know we will not offend us or will cause us embarrassment? Are we limiting God's power and impact through our lives by not extending beyond what we, can, what we are comfortable with? David here is an example of one who practices sacrificial giving. How is our giving? How is our commitment to God? How is our service to the Lord and His people? How about those outside His kingdom? How about those who are unchurched? C.S. Lewis said this, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. But I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. Henry Taylor also mentioned this. He who gives what he would as readily throw away 
gives without generosity. For the essence of generosity is in self-sacrifice. The giving is sacrificial. However, brothers and sisters, in the right perspective, when you realize the bigger picture, the beauty of God's grace, eventually the sacrificial giving can quickly turn into a cheerful giving. David was very willing to give because of the mercy and the grace that he has received from God. And we, when we see our sacrificial giving in that manner, it will immediately transform to a cheerful giving. I would like to close in this idea because I cannot help but see this in the action of David and his decisions. Earlier, we started with, this, with the words, um, we're happy to hear that things are paid. You know, we do not like to pay the price, right? If possible, we like to lower the price. I think some of us here know, or many of us know here, sa 168, the ganta mahangyo, di ba, sa 168, ukembo. Pwede pa ba kaketampo, etsoibo. We use those terms, kung hangyo ta sa 168. Sometimes we use that also in Kogon, no? We like to say, can you lower the price? Napabay hang you, sir. We do not like to pay the price. But life in this imperfect world, there are consequences. Every sin, every bad thoughts, every wrong actions, there are sins that is happening and there are consequences in life. And the consequence of sin is destruction and death. The price is eternal separation from our Creator God. However, if we approach God through the atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, God will forgive our sins. No matter what we have done, no matter how terrible we are, no matter how dark our past is, God is merciful. God will accept us and He will deliver us from the judgment to come. Through Jesus Christ and His atoning sacrifice for us, the price is paid. It is finished. This is the strong declaration of God's word. Galatians 1 4 says, Who gave himself for us to deliver for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father? And Galatians 3:13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Brothers and sisters in Christ. The penalty of our sins is paid. In making these sacrifices for his people, David foreshadowed the actions of Jesus Christ, the ultimate son of David. And do you know what? That threshing floor that David bought, it is also a part of the lot that later on Solomon used to build the temple of Jerusalem where they offer sacrifice to God. And that temple there signifies the place where Jesus Christ is also offered as a sacrifice for our sin. He is not just the temple, but He is also the Lamb of God. He is also the sacrifice. He is also the high priest officiating the sacrifice so that we sinful people can approach the holy God. The song earlier was very relevant the song offering who are we that we can come before the holy throne of god only through jesus christ as we give our offering to god let us remember that he is faithful he is gracious and so brothers and sisters and friends remember this christ paid the penalty of our sins it is finished already let us live in hope let us put our trust in the lord knowing that he always looks after us let us bow our hands let us pray <clears throat> take a moment to reflect on god's message if it is your first time to hear the love that god has for each one of us here jesus christ paying the 
penalty for our sins. If it's your first time to hear God's grace and you want to take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ always offers the invitation that you take him as your Lord and Savior. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is merciful, or a God who keeps your promises. Your word says in John 3, 36, that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, that whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but that the wrath of God remains on him. We thank you, Lord, for paying the full price of our sins, the sins of our past, the sins that we are struggling, and the sins that we might commit, will commit in the future. Lord, you are good. And help us, Lord, to trust in you, to remain hopeful despite in these trying times, Lord, that you are with us. Help us, Lord, to turn our sacrificial giving into a joyful giving, because you alone deserve this. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we have our Lord's Supper this morning, let us first recite uh, the Apostles' Creed. I request everyone to please stand. I believe in God on the count of three. One, two, three. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. On the night when Jesus Christ was betrayed, the last day he was about to fulfill his mission to die on the cross for our sins, to express God's great love for each one of us, he took the bread signifying his body. He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also that evening, after supper, Jesus Christ took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. Let us drink. Our gracious and loving God, we truly are undeserving to come before your throne. But because of your grace, because of your love, and because of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Mediator, you have given us access to your throne of grace. And so, Lord, we ask you that you help us live in grace, live in faith in you, and live with full of hope, knowing, Lord, that your promises are sure, and someday, you will, reunite, uh, you will reunite us with yourself and with our loved ones who has gone before us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, Lord, thank you for our deliverance. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man will dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. Through your mercy. 
himself sanctify you through and through. May your soul, body, and spirit be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have three questions for our talk it over for us to maximize our message this morning. What sin are you harboring recently that, need, that needs confession and repentance? How can your care group or our church community can help you overcome it? David did not give offering to God that cost him nothing. In what area do we need to practice sacrificial giving? And remember, in the right perspective, it can turn to cheerful giving. Lastly, how does the idea that Jesus Christ paid the payment for our sins bring you hope in these challenging times? I hope you could discuss these questions with your care group, your family members, and make the most of our message today. God bless everyone.